Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries and some of the more unexpected discoveries when it comes to the idea of evolution. And specifically these two studies that seem to suggest that the evolution itself doesn't seem to be as random as we originally thought. There does seem to be a certain type of bias when it comes to different types of traits being evolved in different species. Although in this case it's important to make a side note that it's not like something is guiding evolution or that there is some kind of a higher power that seems to be evolving species, but in reality what it suggests is that there is definitely some kind of a bias in the DNA itself where certain traits are more likely to evolve than others and certain types of mutations are more likely to occur. Something that some studies implied in the past, but something that these two specific studies that you can find in the description below have now been able to definitively show using plants and humans. And so in this video let's discuss some of the findings in these studies and possibly talk about the potential implications from these discoveries. First of all, let's start with the plants. So generally when it comes to evolution and understanding of the evolution today, a lot of scientists um, still believe that most of it is kind of random. Essentially, a typical gene will experience some kind of a mutation, either due to the damage to DNA or possibly due to some kind of a genetic variation from something else entirely, and this will have some kind of an effect on the species. The typical example used in textbooks is usually of the so-called Darwin's finches. The different shape of the beak of different finches will actually have them consume different types of food. Some of them are only good at that particular food and nothing else. So the speciation in this case is explained through these very random mutations sometime in the past. So through these mutations, some of the birds acquired a different shape and structure of their beak. And then through the process of natural selection and essentially the pressure from the environment, eventually some of the species will become more successful and thus dominate a certain environment. And that's essentially why on, for example, the famous Galapagos Island, we find so many different species adapted to a very specific niche. But there are some other views, such as Lamarckism or Lamarckian inheritance, that make some other suggestions that have never really been proven. For example, that the parent organism can actually sort of influence the evolution of their uh, progeny, evolution of their children, by doing certain things and by acquiring certain characteristics. So in other words, that some mutations could be somewhat guided, not necessarily random. But even though this idea has never really been definitively proven, there have been some studies that suggested it could be true. And this particular study using plants seems to suggest so even more. So in this study, the scientists conducted a controlled experiment using a plant sometimes referred to as the mouse ear cress. But they also made sure that some of the plants they were studying had some kind of a genetic damage that could be tracked. And specifically the scientists wanted to analyze different mutations and how they developed in plants in order to determine how random all of this is. Now in theory, the idea behind natural selection should actually get rid of most of the harmful mutations relatively quickly. Or in other words, any harmful mutation is just not going to make it because the plant is just going to be too weak. Moreover, any kind of a mutation because of certain types of damage should be more or less randomly distributed. So for example, no matter where you look at the gene and no matter what part of the gene you're analyzing, there should be a relatively similar amount of various mutations. But when studying the genes of hundreds of these plants after growing them in a lab for quite some time, and also after analyzing thousands of different mutations in these plants, the scientists realized that the mutations they discovered were not random at all. For example, some parts of the gene were actually a lot less likely to have mutations, with certain genes, such as the genes responsible for, for example, respiration, being a lot more likely to mutate than other genes, such as the ones responsible for extremely important biological processes, different types of regulation inside these cells, or some other genes that are usually found in all of the cells inside the plant. In other words, the essential genes. And so there was a definitive bias protecting these essential genes from mutation. Now, it might make sense, but it's not really what we're taught in biology class. We're usually taught that all of these mutations are completely random. This is not the case at all. 
Likewise, some other sections were more likely to mutate. In other words, it was almost like an encouragement for the plant to evolve in a certain direction in a certain way. And these biases are very likely built in by the evolution itself. In other words, throughout the generations of these plants evolving over time, the chromosomes created a kind of a pressure for certain traits to evolve more likely than other traits, and for the essential stuff to remain completely or almost completely untouched. And I guess, technically, it makes total sense, it's just biologically this was never proven. And so this particular study proves that various types of mutations seem to encourage beneficial mutations. They seem to discourage certain types of mutations that would lead to something more dangerous inside the plant. Although chances are that the mutations might still happen in those regions, but it's that the DNA repair mechanism is a lot more effective. It's thus able to prevent certain mutations from developing further on. And in terms of how all of this works, it might be actually related to different types of proteins wrapped around different types of DNA molecules. In other words, by possibly discovering which of the proteins are more likely to protect certain types of DNA, we might be able to even predict where the evolution could take a certain species. This is obviously something we don't know how to do yet, but maybe in the future. Interestingly enough, this also kind of relates to the idea of some species that we sometimes refer to as a living fossil. This is usually species whose evolution or whose mutations have stopped millions of years ago. Now, this is interesting because it means that sometimes this can be taken to the extreme. The DNA can actually become almost entirely protected with the species sort of more or less stopping its evolution. Now, how all this relates is not obviously entirely clear yet, but we are slowly starting to see the bigger picture with more of these studies. But I guess the more important question is, of course, how all this relates to us, humans. Mostly because we would love to find a way to preserve certain types of genome in human beings to avoid, for example, certain types of disease. And that's sort of where this second study comes in, in regards to what they found in humans, specifically studying probably the most well-studied protein in human beings. For example, a lot of different studies in the past have actually studied a lot of different mutations or variations of the hemoglobin protein to discover what it does to human body. But for the purposes of this particular study, or this idea, the scientists focused on just one of the variants. The variant that's usually referred to as HBS mutation, which normally, and surprisingly, protects people against malaria. And the mutation in this particular protein is very interesting because if it goes wrong, it can sometimes produce what's known as sickle cell anemia, which leads to the red blood cells assuming a different shape and not being able to absorb as much oxygen, which obviously creates a lot of problems in the human body. But when the protein creates the HBS mutation, it actually prevents the malaria parasite from being able to infect these cells, basically protecting people in the regions where malaria is a problem. And you might be aware that malaria, even today, is still the deadliest parasite on the planet. The estimates suggest that it kills anywhere from one to several million people per year. So obviously having some kind of a beneficial protection from malaria would obviously benefit everyone living in these regions. And this map here sort of shows you some of the mutations and some of the locations of these mutations in regards to the distribution across the world. So for example, you're going to find some of them in India, you're going to find some of the HBS genes in parts of Middle East, also parts of Europe, but a large part of it is in Central Africa. But the thing is, using the idea of random mutations, you would expect these genes to develop everywhere, sort of in all locations on the planet. And so obviously through the process of mutation and through generations of people living in the region, you would expect higher levels of this gene present there, simply because anyone not having the gene is just not going to make it, not going to survive. While at the same time you would expect uh, these genes to also be evolving in, for example, Europe, but not becoming prominent simply because there is no malaria present and no selective pressure. With the basic idea here being that the mutations should still be happening at the same rate, they should still be sort of more or less the same no matter where people live. Yet this new study discovered something different. They've discovered that people living in those African regions also seem to have much more frequent mutations 
with a higher rate of generation of that particular protein known as HBS. In other words, the protein mutation that leads to protection from malaria seems to be higher in those African regions. Or to rephrase this, the mutation seems to be generated preferentially in the regions where malaria is present. Something that would be extremely difficult to explain using typical Darwinian theories. And for the study, the scientists actually focused on the idea of the rate of mutation or the frequency of mutation in certain parts of the gene. They didn't really look at how many genes accumulated over time. And they've discovered that this particular gene mutates a lot more frequently in people in those regions as opposed to people living in Europe. With the paper itself providing a little bit more information about how all of this was done and how they used the uh, DNA from various donors to determine that the mutation rate was different depending on where you live. And today it's believed that because of the way malaria works, it's sort of been causing this selective pressure on humans for at least 10,000 years. With certain beneficial mutations producing certain types of proteins, eventually balancing out with the ones that were not beneficial and produced problems. And that's sort of how we usually explain the idea of having certain genes a lot more likely to occur in certain regions. But the frequency of mutation, that's not something that can be explained very easily. Once again, just like with those plans we've discussed previously, it means that there is some kind of a bias, selective bias, that eventually develops the frequency that's much higher, even though the species itself is the same. Which once again confirms that mutations might not be as random as we initially thought for many years. With the rates of mutation very likely being influenced by various proteins, various structures of chromosomes, potentially the pressure from the environment itself, and possibly some other biases we're still not aware of. Which once again confirms that we just have so much more to learn about our own biology. The story is far from over, and it's actually way more complex than anyone ever thought. But that's of course why it's so interesting to study these particular concepts, and why I'm going to be coming back to this in some of the future videos. On that note, check out the studies in the description below, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.